Okay? I'll take care of this. I'll, I'll fight my way through. I'll get the car and I'll bring it around. I finished Control. I loved it. I then continued to finish Alan Wake. I love that. I enjoyed the story. I made a whole story recap for the Buds in case they wanted the backstory playthrough for the Bright, Bright Falls DLC and Control. In retrospect, I believe I was a bit too harsh on the combat and gameplay systems in that game in my efforts to prepare the uninitiated for what kind of gameplay experience they were in for. But overall, I stand by my thoughts that the story and cast of characters are the reason you proceed through that game. I will say, however, that the combat was actually pretty inoffensive and that it was overall the game was refreshing, that the game was very linear, no icons leading me by the nose everywhere. It had no skill trees or upgrade systems or any number of other modern gameplay conventions that are beaten into the ground at this point. Quantum Break's a different animal. It's definitely still a story-driven experience like Alan Wake, but the combat is more modern and so is the graphical fidelity. So what are my thoughts on Quantum Break? Newer and more polished systems must mean I like it better, right? Well, not exactly. Quantum Break was released in 2016 and boy does it still look good. I have no complaints about the visuals or art style. When there are shards of fractured time or uh, pieces of reality floating around and gunshots are going off, it's visually stunning. The alpha effects are really impressive and pair up exceptionally with the stark visual style. Much of the game takes place in environments that I would describe as a far future robot art gallery. There are tons of stark white walls with accompanying yellow or red bursts of accent color. When you have that as a backdrop to slow motion gunshots and time bombs, shit looks really cool. The other environments you end up in tend to be ur urban neighborhood settings, which also really work well thematically. I also noticed some graffiti with stuff like AWE on the walls, giving me those pings of like, oh yeah, I get that reference. It kind of makes me wonder if Control was pitched first and Quantum Break just won out for Microsoft's budgetary affections. Quantum Break is famously set up into segments of gameplay followed by TV show live action segments. I'm no documentarian and I'll leave the backstory to what led to this creative decision to someone with more skills to investigate and discuss it. The gameplay segments are interesting because on one hand, I really enjoyed some of the writing for the characters. The combat's typical third person cover shooter fare with the twist of Jack having the ability to manipulate time. This manifests at different periods of the game where his powers will unlock. It starts simply with him having time vision, which roughly equates to survival vision in Tomb Raider, detective vision in Batman, or a million other series at this point. He eventually unlocks time stop, which can freeze enemies in place for a moment, time dodge, which is just a quick flashy dodge, time rush, which is just sprinting really fast while everyone else is in slow-mo, Time Blast, which is an ability where you detonate an AoE blast of energy, or Time Space, I don't know, not really explained. And finally, Time Shield. I didn't really use Time Shield. It's good that he has it for certain cutscenes and whatnot, but even in Control or other games, using a shield just doesn't feel dynamic to me. Being able to dash away around or around someone feels more active and satisfying. I imagine most people would enjoy this combat more than the Alan Wake experience as Jack is like certainly more nimble and responsive than Alan, but I have to admit that I think they missed an opportunity here. The problem is as soon as you get a power, enemies are introduced that immediately counter that power. So having enemies with utility gear that assist them with manipulating time in the same manner as you kind of makes you feel like a less special snowflake. It also means you can't use time stop to stop them specifically. They can time rush just like you, and the heavily armored ones can't even be affected by the time blasts. So what that means is you inevitably kind of end up playing this game a lot like a regular run-of-the-mill third-person shooter with a few advanced movement abilities. I'm sure there's some that figured out the proper timings of when to use the abilities to get the maximum effect, but for me it led to a more meat and potatoes playstyle that took me just to the get to the next story moment. The actual gunplay has its issues as well. Perhaps being more grounded in reality, they felt it was important to give weapons spray patterns instead of being laser beams like in Call of Duty or something of that nature. The spray seems overtuned to the point of some automatics feeling borderline unusable due to their wild inaccuracy. 
I stuck with pistols and other single fire weaponry for the most part as a lot of the enemies have thick hardy armor and are very spongy. Even when it comes to headshots, many of them take multiples to be brought down. Take advantage of your mobility here to maximize fun factor. For me, sitting behind waist-high walls and taking pot shots just ain't my style and seems against the spirit of the game in the first place, even though there is a cover system in place. Being more modern than Alan Wake means of course the Quantum Break has a skill tree system to level up your abilities. It's very bare bones and I found myself ignoring it until I went in the menu and I remembered I had a bunch of points to spend waiting for me. If you're the type who likes being rewarded for exploration, then you'll have something to hunt as the upgrade points can be found scattered throughout the environment. In terms of music, it's more understated than my experiences with Alan Wake or Control. It's suitable for a sci-fi time travel adventure and it's not bad by any metric, but it's also more forgettable. I can't recall any tracks offhand. I will have them looping in the background throughout this video so you can judge for yourself. There's some more upbeat traditional tracks at the end of episodes that I'm sure are fitting, but throughout my gameplay I didn't have any tracks that are linked in my mind inextricably to the game. All in all, I would leave it as good, but not noteworthy. The story starts as our protagonist Jack Joyce is accounting the past events with an unnamed woman in an office building. He begins a story when he's dropped off to a college campus by a taxi at 4 in the morning. He's been invited by a friend, Paul Serene, to help him with some vague experiment. The emails sent to Paul were cryptic, but our main man, Jack, explains he wouldn't have asked him to come if it wasn't important. Before he enters Paul's lab, he's accosted by a protester at, at some tents in the quad. They never explicitly call it the quad, but hell, I went to school. That bitch is the quad. So here they are at the quad, right? This woman explains to him that a nearby company called Monarch Industries has bought up the land, including the campus's historic library, and they're planning on tearing it down for some new lab or such and such. This is also the location of a video set up in a tent featuring a movie trailer featuring narration by Alan Wake and agents looking to line up with Alex Casey on it. I was five minutes in, there was already Alan Wake references. I was digging it. Eventually, he runs into his friend Paul, who runs him through the basics of his project. Dude's working on a time machine. He needs you to help him activate it to prove it works, otherwise, university is gonna pull his funding. This is the point where I gotta go on a small tangent. During the course of the game, they'll throw a lot of time jargon at you. I'm a big fan of Michael Crichton books. One of the reasons I always loved his books is he would take the subject that was science fiction, but describe the attributes of it in such like detail that he would make you believe in its plausibility. I don't need that kind of detail to enjoy a science fiction story, but it helps if you want the story to be taken seriously. Quantum Breaks takes its story seriously, but I wish they were a li little bit more lighthearted so we could easily take the other path. The other path is one where you as the audience mutually agree with the author, in this case Remedy, to sit down and set aside your disbelief with a sincere desire to just enjoy, have a good time, and engage with the story. That's the path I took to enjoyment on this one, but I didn't always feel like the story followed with me. It's not that Remedy doesn't attempt to explain the time travel mechanics, but as with most time travel stories, if you look at the holes in the logic, you'll find them. Back to the time machine. The thing works. The problem is Jack's brother, who is also a time scientist apparently, shows up spouting stuff like, time is gonna end. Paul is still in the machine when a malfunction occurs. In the midst of a commotion, a crew of heavily armed, armed in the midst of the commotion, a crew of heavily armed security forces enter the lab. Paul retreats to the time machine to some unknown future time. Jack, being out of the machine, is also infected by the blast of the malfunction. This gives Jack superpowers. Time powers. This is a solid comic book, I think. Especially if you consider some of the sad-ass B-tier comic heroes, a guy with straight-up time powers has got to be worth something. Jack and his brother go through hell in a handbasket to try and escape the university, but they're relentlessly hunted by the aforementioned Monarch Industries infantry. What the fuck kind of private company has a security task force like this, especially since they were dispatched with such immediacy? Will keeps mentioning he needs to get this device he made to fix the new flaw in time. From here on out, this device will henceforth be known as the Time MacGuffin. I mean, uh, I mean the countermeasure. 
Time is now broken and will periodically stutter throughout the rest of the game. When time stutters occur, Johnny Everyday is frozen in time. After dispatching hordes of monarch security forces and being assisted by a female monarch employee named Beth, Will and Jack are on the brink of escape when they run into the head of monarch. It's Paul, WTF mate? The rest of the game amounts to both protagonists and antagonists trying to fix the stutters in time and get the timeline shifted back to normal. Both groups have their own idea of what is proper, and you're given choices throughout that change the timeline and even decide the fates of certain characters. Once I get to the spoiler section, I'll discuss in brief. Future Shane here. It isn't so brief after all. Some of the consequences of my personal actions, but since I only did one playthrough so far, I'll only gloss over some of the consequences of my decisions. The live action segments are a conundrum. The first episode or two were not boring. They were just not nearly as engaging as the gameplay segments. Some of the later episodes had a built up an investment in me for the storylines of the characters, so I wanted to see what events transpired. The problem is if you're going to insert five episodes of a television show into your game, it has to have the production budget to match the output of the game itself. Let me show you the first cinematic of the game, followed by an action scene from the first episode. Growing fracture leading to the end of time. In-game, a boat collides with a bridge that Jack is currently on, causing insane chaos. In the show, a Nissan loses a headlight. It just goes to show that everything done in the show segment could have easily been done in-engine and possibly quite better while costing less money. Also troubling is the fact that the cast of the show barely shows up in the game. It feels as though two different distinct teams made two different visions of their project and they're merged together. Continuity be damned. I also felt the writing was stronger in the game than it was in the show. There are moments when I was reading in-game emails or other collectibles that made me consider the events and it really began to ground me in the world. On the other hand, the next episode would start and I'd be taken away from the events or characters I was just starting to be engaged with. I felt for certain characters in the game, but the show segments very much felt like an episode of 24 on Fox with half the budget. It doesn't mean the show segments are worthless or without value in general, as the acting from the cast in every role in the game and the show were both fantastic. I'm also thankful to say I always understood every character's motivation. One of my biggest pet peeves is having characters behave in ways I don't believe or I can't understand. Last of Us 2. <clears throat> some of the best writing in the game was found in some of the various emails and collectible data found scattered throughout the environments. There was one piece of writing that I feel like I would be neglectful if I didn't mention. At a computer terminal, I found a message from a frustrated security guard, Paul Livingstone, who feels unappreciated. He sends an email to a high-ranking science official in Monarch asking for her advice on the science in his screenplay, Time Knife. I wish to read you a brief excerpt from the screenplay, as it is one of the best pieces of writing I've ever experienced. <clears throat> Time Knife. Act 1. Interior. Office. Night. Bruce Savage stands in his office. He is sexually attractive. Someone knocks on Bruce's door and he opens it. It's a scientist lady. She looks like a librarian with glasses, but she is actually a scientist. You could tell because she has a lab coat. Scientist lady, help me. Bruce, okay. Scientist lady, take this knife because some bad apples are trying to steal it and it is very important. Bruce, okay. Lady Scientist, what is your name, handsome? Bruce, I'm Bruce, let's shake hands. Scientist Lady, wow, you almost broke my hand with that handshake. You are definitely a tough guy. She is impressed with Bruce's strength. She looks at his large biceps like they are delicious pieces of ham, but she doesn't want to eat them. Lady Scientist, here is the knife. Lady Scientist hands Bruce the knife. It looks mostly like a knife, but also like a time machine, because it is both a knife and a time machine, but Bruce doesn't know that yet. Goons break through the windows and shoot the scientist lady. She dies. Scientist lady, avenge me. 
Bruce. Okay. Bruce kills the goons with his legs by doing lots of kicking at them. They're dead real quick. Bruce. Looks like I got a leg up on you guys. The audience probably laughs here, so Bruce waits to deliver his next line for about five seconds until everyone's calmed down. Bruce, what's so special about this knife? Bruce stabs the knife into his chair. The chair disappears. Bruce, the chair disappeared. He looks at the picture on the wall, which is a big photograph from 1932 with lots of people from 1932 in it. Bruce's chair is in the picture. Bruce, interesting. My chair traveled back in time to 1932 when I stabbed it. When I stab things, they travel through time. That explains why this knife looks like a knife, but also like a time machine, because it is both. Bruce's real goofy friend from across the hall runs into the room. He trips on something on the floor. His name is Slabo. He isn't as fat as his name sounds. Slabo. Aw, oh, yeah. That's Slabo's catchphrase. He says it in a real funny way. Scientist lady. Bruce, you saved my life. The scientist lady was only faking being dead. Scientist lady. Are you married? Bruce. Only to my job. Scientist lady. I find that attractive, but also respectable. She kisses Bruce's cheek. End scene. That's where I'm going to end it. I struggle to not read all of Act 1, but I should leave some for people to find themselves. I spent the rest of the game looking for further screenplays from Bruce Livingstone. This film could be the next Kung Fury. Please, Remedy, authorize this production. The world needs Time Knife. I need Time Knife. All right, all right. So this is the point where I put up some kind of spoiler warning and maybe put a time code if I can figure out a way to summarize my thoughts afterwards with sufficiently without having to rely on what I discuss from the spoiler section. If you've already beaten the game or simply don't mind hearing about spoilers, then let's continue. Quantum Break is more loosely affiliated with Control and Alan Wake, and I think that most players will find this an easier game to push through than Alan Wake, so I'm not going to do a complete story walkthrough with super in-depth granularity. Again, editing Shane here, I go much further into it than I really planned on. After the end of Act 1, Paul destroys the library discussed by the protesters and it collapses and kills Will, leaving Jack alone under Monarch control. This leads to what the game refers to as junction points. As the player under control of Paul, you get to choose how Monarch plays in the future. Due to his exposure to the Chronon field, the energy that makes time travel possible, Paul is not only able to manipulate time, but he is also able to see possible futures as well. The first choice is about the direction Paul wants to take Monarch. He could take a hardline stance and use his Monarch security forces like a military coup and take control of the city to execute his plans. Or the other option is to start a PR campaign to poison the well and turn the public against Jack. During these decision points I role played as I believe the characters would behave based on their behaviors that I've seen during the game this, thus far. I chose to execute the PR campaign in the first junction. I figured Paul's built up this company into an obvious powerhouse and he wouldn't want to turn the public against him after so much work. As the story progresses, you're introduced to a number of other characters, including Paul's right-hand man, Martin Hatch, who is acted superbly by Lance Reddick. I cannot impress upon you how well he played this role in a sea of already notable performances. We encounter Beth again, who attempts to free Jack from the custody of Monarch, even if her assistance might not be as necessary as she thought. After their inevitable reunion, she eventually guides him to an abandoned swimming pool where Will had constructed another time machine. It isn't functioning though. Beth knows someone with the capabilities to get it running and that takes us back into the lion's den. We'll see you soon, Paul. Our boy Jack Joyce navigates through some monarch subterranean labs and emerges on the other side of the island retreat where Paul has given a speech to his employees explaining his motivations. He's using a device to create a protective barrier from the time stutters. He calls this the life boat. He calls this the lifeboat. There he will relocate all the elite time scientists, my words, not theirs, where they can work on fixing the time rip while the rest of the world is frozen in time. William Joyce had created a device he believes can fix the terror in time, and that is what Jack and Beth's motivation is for the rest of the game. 
At the island retreat, Jack and Beth eventually apprehend the scientist Sophia Amaral, who is also the woman of our security playwright's affections, by the way. During the chaos of all this, it has become clear that Martin has his own motivations and is actively working against Paul at this point. At the beginning of the game, when Paul went back in time after the time machine malfunction, he ended up making his way through time in many directions. He saw what he refers to as the end of time. He also ended up back in time far enough to where he was able to create and establish Monarch to the point where they were already a very powerful company by the opening sequence of this game. The downsides of Paul reliving all this time is that the same chronon exposure that has made him powerful with his time abilities has also slowly been poisoning him. He's taken a medicine to keep him in check, but Marvin can see that he's slowly losing it, and the medicine is slowly losing effectiveness. Jack has just been recently exposed to the time field, but Paul's been living with this exposure for decades at this point. Back at Will's swimming pool lab, Sophia's in charge of getting the time machine working again. William left a message specifically to Beth that tells her that his countermeasure was stolen from his lab in July 2010. Keep in mind, presently, we are in 2016, and he believed that it was Beth that did it. The plan now is to travel back to the past and get hands on Will's time-fixing device. The problem is that Sophia is loyal to Paul. She did indeed fix the time machine, but as Beth walks through, Sophia informs Jack she's already notified Monarch and she's changed the date to where Beth went back at a much different time than she anticipated. Sophia reveals that the countermeasure device that will that Will created is actually the same device that will power the lifeboat. Jack decides he's gonna follow through with his original plan anyways. He fixes the dates in the time machine and proceeds through to steal the device. Upon arrival, he encounters a friendly but very different face. Beth was sent to the end of time. She saw them fail and she knows that time has an end. To say her morale is low would be vastly understating her situation. She had to fight her way through Paul and they both eventually ended up back at the first time a time machine was ever turned on, 1999. Beth met with Will, who is actually the first person to ever invent time travel. This encounter with Beth is the reason that Will was so, let's just say, testy in the beginning of the game, and also the reason that he created the countermeasure. He created it far before any problem with time rips ever existed. This is where Jack realizes that having spent so much time reliving the past has changed Beth. This segment of the game was the part that hit me the hardest. For me, this hour or so long segment makes playing this entire game worth it. Throughout the game, while in exterior environments, you've been encountering strange graffiti that was almost prophetic. It turns out that it was Beth's hobby to pass the time since she's been here since 1999. She was our sagely artist. I read her journal of her internal thoughts and according to my recording footage, I spent 8 minutes solemnly reading her inner thoughts and turmoil as she relived years of her life all over again in solitude. She told Will about everything to get him to create the countermeasure. She's the reason that William's time machine was moved to the swimming pool and away from his original lab to keep Paul Serene from having access to it. In 1999, there isn't the technology to send her back forward in time, so she waits it out. She celebrates Y2K again. She attempts to warn the world about 9-11, but fails. She describes how her whole life has led to this. As a child, she received a notebook from a woman describing the major and sometimes even minor events of her life, preparing for the life that she was about to live. She told her not to trust anyone until she met Jack. Her childhood was one of isolation and preparation. She trained herself physically and mentally to become the strong woman who would one day be employed by Monarch and then betray them to assist the Joyce brothers. She is now the woman passing the notebook to her young self in 1999. She knows about Jack now, but he doesn't know of her yet. They aren't supposed to meet until 2016. She subtly spies on him as he lives his life. She watches over Jack and his brother as they mourn their parents' funeral. She couldn't stop their car crash. It was meant to happen. Again, the segment was amazing. Again, the writing here was excellent. I was so invested in Beth now. I wanted to give a digital character a hug. Holy shit, man. Good stuff. 
Then the story takes us to Paul fighting with Beth and the countermeasure going off unexpectedly, which sends Jack inexplicably back to present day while Paul and Beth are left in 2010. Jack can see the remnants of the past where he's forced to watch Paul execute Beth. The reasoning behind this time shift that sent him forward in time is left unexplained and it bothers me. There's no other reason for him being the only one sent into present day other than it's just a plot contrivance. The emotional manipulation of the death of Beth still hit me though. I'd be lying if I said anything to the contrary. All of these events have transpired in the game world. The events of the episodes can vary depending on your junction choice actions, and much of that side plot would be hard to describe with any satisfaction without a blow by blow, so I'll leave that with someone who's more capable, and I'm sure editing this is already going to be a true test of my will. At the end of my story, Jack returns to Monarch HQ to reacquire the countermeasure. Due to my junction decisions, I got two of the major characters from the main plotline of the show either dead or mortally wounded. Oops. Due to the fact that we came back to just before where the game originally started on the timeline, Jack is also able to return to save Will from the rubble of the destroyed library at the beginning of the game, just in the nick of time. Jack and Will escape the Monarch forces because in this timeline, they have Jack in their custody. As a time stutter hits on their way out, Jack has a moment to see Beth on the campus. This is a bittersweet moment to say the least. Jack whispers something in her ear as they depart. Using Will's swimming pool machine, they go to the future to the point in time when time fractured. This is when the countermeasure must be deployed. Upon arrival, they're greeted by Paul and his monarch goons. I've heard several people complain about this final boss fight. By no means did I feel this was redefining the genre or anything, but after a couple of goes I finished Paul off and I had no real major complaints other than some of his abilities consume much of the combat arena and it can be somewhat muddy to read. For me it was more just about staying mobile. As a disclaimer though, I played through this game on normal as to leisurely make my way through it to finish the game. Perhaps on higher difficulties this fight is completely broken and aggravating so take my feelings on it with a grain of salt. After Paul is finally dispatched once and for all, Will activates his countermeasure while describing what will happen with some of his patented time jargon. Just before the countermeasure deploys, Paul makes a final intent to undo your work. The countermeasure does its job, however, and was successful. Or was it? It's kind of weird that Paul disappeared. Now that we circle back to Jack being interviewed by the Monarch employee at the beginning of our story. In this future timeline, the whole mess has been blamed on Paul Serene. The game ends with our interviewer prodding Jack. Paul Serene's entire philosophy was that time is a set path and nothing can be changed. At the time, you obviously disagreed. But after everything you've seen and done, we need to know. What do you believe now? Was he right? Or is it possible to change things? I'll come back for you. I don't know about you guys, but I think he's gonna try and go back and save Beth. Let's welcome back the non-spoiler people now. Time pirates? I mean, I guess they kind of foreshadowed it with the ethereal vessel in Tortuga, but I'm not buying it. Anyhow, in terms of the actual events of the plot, as with any time travel story, there are plenty of areas where you can poke holes, but I think they did a good job of taking me on the journey with them, even if I wish this game had a bit more of a sense of humor about itself like Alan Wake did. Also though, I will say there are times uh, where that self-serious tone really paid off for me, as it did with Beth's storyline. Although I was critical about the combat, in the end, it's still pretty fun to warp around and sock a dude into oblivion or speed behind a guy and shoot his time backpack to freeze him in place. If you play the game on normal difficulty, it's a fairly easy romp to dunk on some goofy monarch goons, and there's definitely enjoyment to be had there. Just remember to take the semi-auto approach or burst fire automatics, so that way you maximize accuracy. If someone were to ask if I recommend this game, I certainly would, especially given its price these days and how breezy it was to get through. 
I think for most people, it would be easier to recommend that than Alan Wake. However, if you ask me which game I like better, I'll definitely reply Alan Wake. In my case, the strange offbeat tone of the world of Alan Wake combined with the cast of quirky characters really got under my skin. I really enjoyed certain character arcs and the beautiful visuals in Quantum Break, but it lacked the same level of charm to take it to the next level, I think. In the end, it's just a matter of taste, and Quantum Break is certainly a worthwhile experience. I will reiterate just how much I appreciated this segment with Beth's backstory, just because I wish that this story was a bit less serious does not mean that someone else wouldn't enjoy it for exactly that reason. Thank you for anyone who sat through all that. I feel silly taking all this time writing scripts and editing these videos for a very small audience, but at the same time, I'm really enjoying the experience and the mental exercise of examining these games. Thanks.